Good morning everybody, my name is Tracy Roberts and I'm the Labour candidate for Peers and so proud to be here at Aries Rail and to host Anthony Albanese, the leader of the Australian Labour Party and fantastic that he's here in Perth, just arrived at one minute past midnight and it was his birthday yesterday so we reckon he's got the longest birthday ever today and yesterday. But uh, to Aries Rail, to you and McAllister and Ben, and a huge thank you for hosting us here today. This is a real showcase of a thriving business that started from very humble beginnings and is now local employment for many people. And we've just been talking to apprenticeships who live local so we can still enjoy that lifestyle and have a great opportunity for employment. And that economic prosperity, the thriving business that is actually servicing not only Western Australia, Australia, but also internationally. And for Anthony Albanese to be here is, uh, and to see this for himself is, um, is fantastic. I know I've, I've experienced firsthand his support of outer metropolitan growth councils. Being on the National Growth Area Alliance, the Deputy Chair, and also the Australian Local Government Association, I know how hard Anthony Albanese works. I know his passion, his connection for Alta Metropolitan and his support. So without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Anthony to the microphone to say a few words and thank you and welcome to WA. Well, thanks very much, Tracy, and thanks to Ewan and Ben and the other workers here at Aries for welcoming us here to uh, this extraordinary facility. An extraordinary facility that's creating jobs, giving skills to young Australians and making a difference to our national economy. And not just here in Perth, began here, but is now of course contributing on the east coast as well, Melbourne, uh, Brisbane and it will be uh, opening up in Sydney very soon. It's a great example of Australian manufacturing, of value adding, of making sure that our economy is strengthened, a more resilient Australia. That is one of the lessons from the recent couple of years that we've been through. How does the Australian economy become more resilient? How do we get more secure work, more skilled workforce and a future made in Australia? We know on the East Coast uh, my local light rail line is shut down because they've got to get parts from Spain. We should be making things here, making trains here, making trams here, making more buses here, making more uh, heavy vehicles here, making sure as well that we have businesses like this one that are creating high value jobs for the economy. We'll get better outcomes, better outcomes with jobs being created here but also better outcomes in terms of efficiency and that connection uh, here in Australia. And that is why one of our main planks of a better future for Australia is a future made in Australia. Can I make this uh, a couple of other points as well, which is that it's great to be here with Tracy. Uh, Tracy Roberts is someone who I got to know uh, through my engagement with local government and regional development and the National Growth Areas Alliance. I rang Tracy and asked her to stand for this seat. As the Mayor of Wanneroo, as a champion for our outer suburbs, I want Tracy, as part of the federal Labor team in government, to make a difference. And I'm very confident that Tracy will do just that. And I'm very proud to have her as just one of the quality candidates that we're putting forward here in the West to join a Labor government, a Labor government that works with the McGowan government, not against it. A Labor government that understands uh, West Australians, that acknowledges the role that Western Australia plays as a driving force in our national economy. The whole country benefits from the success that we see here in Western Australia, from the wealth that's generated, from the businesses that are gener generate that economic activity that goes to fund not just Western Australia but the entire country which is why it's important that Western Australia get its fair share of the GST and why we supported and campaigned for that as well. Can I just uh, make some comments before taking questions as well about uh, what is happening with the extreme weather event 
that is affecting the East Coast. Uh, yesterday morning and the day before, I spent time in Brisbane uh, with flood affected communities on the north side and the south side of Brisbane. Uh, it's been devastating and unfortunately uh, there's potentially more extreme weather on the way and we know that it has gone right down the coast. We saw the devastation in Lismore. Uh, Lismore has always been flood impacted and I had the opportunity to talk with Janelle Saffron, a uh, former federal colleague and the state member for Lismore who had to swim to safety. We hear extraordinary stories uh, coming out and that has occurred right down uh, the coast. Yesterday I, I went uh, home to my home suburb of, of Marrickville, uh, which the Cooks River has flooded and is having an impact on, on homes and communities right around Sydney, the Georges River. Uh, this morning I was able to speak to Andrew Johnson, the CEO of the Bureau of Meteorology. And Andrew asked me to pass on the message of please follow the advice that the Bureau is giving. If you're asked to evacuate your home by a particular time, don't wait, uh, do so, uh, because uh, it's just too important. We have seen tragically a loss of life uh, during these floods. We want to uh, minimise uh, the damage and we want people to stay safe. It's absolutely critical uh, at this time. It will be a difficult uh, couple of days ahead at least. Uh, these extreme weather events uh, which are more intense, uh, which uh, go for uh, longer and are more frequent, are a sign just as the fact that Perth has just had the hottest summer on record, uh, just a sign of the need for us to be a part of acting on climate change, not sitting in the naughty corner as we've done, not engaging in silly climate wars and debates about the science. The science is in and the science is having an impact uh, with the events uh, that, that were predicted and that were predicted again to become more intense by the IPCC report uh, that was handed down uh, just this week. So please uh, follow advice, uh, stay safe and a big thank you once again to our emergency service workers, to our SES workers, to all those volunteers who are helping out their fellow Australians. At the toughest of times, we see the best of Australians. We've seen that during the pandemic, where people have made sacrifices to look after each other, including West Australians, who made sacrifices uh, with uh, border restrictions and other restrictions in order to keep the population safe. Uh, that's a difficult decision to make, but they were the right decisions. And what we're seeing uh, with these extreme weather events is once again, Australians being magnificent in helping each other out, in some cases risking uh, their own lives uh, in order to keep their fellow Australians safe. Well, it is good to be uh, here in Pierce. Pierce is one of the seats that we believe needs a, a new member and they need Tracy Roberts as the member. Uh, she has served this local community well over a long period of time. Uh, I've searched out the right candidates for the right seats. I did that with Chrissy McBain in Ed Monero. Uh, I've done that with Tracy Roberts here in Pierce. Uh, after this, later this morning, I'll be with Tanya Lawrence in the electorate of Hasluck and I'll be meeting with a range of, of other candidates including uh, Zanita Mascarenas uh, just uh, this afternoon as well. Uh, we have outstanding candidates, they're candidates that would make an enormous difference uh, if they received the support of the Australian people to go to, uh, to, go to Canberra to represent them. Uh, it's a big ask, asking someone uh, from the West, uh, it, is, it is more difficult than it is if you live in Sydney, being a member of federal parliament. But these are champions of their local community who are committed uh, to representing their interests in Canberra, and that's very important. And they know as well that it won't just be one-way traffic. They know that I've been a consistent visitor 
to Western Australia for over two decades now. They know my record in supporting infrastructure here in the West. And uh, with Mark McGowan, we'll be talking about uh, the issues facing uh, Western Australia going forward. We'll be talking about uh, infrastructure. We'll be talking about the whole range of, of issues that face uh, West Australians. I always catch up with Mark McGowan uh, when I'm here. I value his advice. I speak to him regularly and I look forward uh, to working uh, with him before the election. Uh, but most importantly, if we are successful in May, I want a federal Labor government that works with the Western Australian government and most importantly with the people of Western Australia. The fact that Scott Morrison chose to side with Clive Palmer in the legal case and used taxpayers' funds a million dollars, including some went directly to Clive Palmer. He doesn't need more money from taxpayers, you might have noticed, and the idea that the federal government joined that court case and supported it uh, when Christian Porter, the local member here, was the Attorney General from Western Australia just shows how out of touch uh, the Morrison government is when it comes to the needs of looking after West Australians. How many seats can Labor win? Are you planning a head start by getting here first? No, I, I committed uh, very early on in a range of interviews that I'd be on the first plane possible into Western Australia. I keep my commitments. That's why I was on the plane uh, last night. I didn't expect to have a birthday that went for 27 hours, but so be it. Uh, I was uh, determined uh, to get here, so we were booked on, on the first plane. I think it was important. Scott Morrison, my understanding is, was going to come uh, next, next week. Uh, I'm not sure what the arrangements are. They've obviously been impacted uh, by him testing positive. I do say this to Scott Morrison, I wish him well, and uh, I wish as well uh, Ben Morton uh, well. Uh, COVID is something that's impacted everyone in the community. It's a reminder that we need to continue to be vigilant and stay safe. How many seats can you make? We're not, this isn't a game of lotto. What this is, is Labor putting forward our constructive plan for a better future for Australia. And one of my messages to people in the West is if you think this federal government is as good as it gets after a decade, uh, then you might be inclined to stay uh, where you are. But if you think you can imagine a better future and then set about creating one, working with a federal Labor government, then it is uh, time to change government. Uh, this government's out of puff. Uh, you see that with governments and you see that in terms of the personnel. Uh, you see not just Christian Porter leaving, but he, he leaves an exit door that's more like a rush to the door with Matthias Cormann, Julie Bishop, Michael Keenan, a range of senior members who were uh, strong voices uh, in the uh, Liberal government have all left. And what we're left with now is that West Australians, I don't think, uh, uh, so certainly not front and centre. Uh, they're completely, they're completely sidelined. Well, Michaelia Cash, I look forward to watching her media conference today, because if she does, it'll be one of the few appearances that she's made. Uh, Michaelia Cash uh, has has no presence in Canberra, or, or you know, I look forward to her interview this Sunday. She might be on Insiders, she might be somewhere, but if it is, it'll be. A, uh, a unique performance. That's part of the problem here, is that Michaelia Cash has the senior, senior roles in the government, uh, but uh, you know, they buried the decision on industrial relations to go after the Australian Workers' Union. Uh, again, uh, government being abused uh, to uh, try to uh, attack, in this case, it was a not so subtle attempt to go after Bill Shorten. Uh, that's all been buried quietly uh, during this period, uh, late on a, on a Friday afternoon, where so many of this government's actions are. And of course we know there, uh, McCallie Cash uh, went to a great deal of effort to avoid uh, scrutiny during that period. We actually need people who are prepared to speak up for Western Australia. Uh, Tracy Roberts, I reckon from time to time, might even become a bit annoying in the caucus because she will speak up 
on, on any issue. We want strong advocates, not people who have cabinet positions but don't make any public appearances. Do you support your colleague Clara Neal's position on uh, wage rises to large fair workforce? Well, I support my position, which is to support wage rises for aged care workers. It's something that we've said consistently. Well, we've said, we have revealed the policy. Uh, we've said on at least 10 occasions, not the least of which was on uh, the 1st of March, the anniversary of the Aged Care Royal Commission, uh, that we would make a submission to the Fair Work Commission saying that there should be a wage rise in accordance with the recommendations uh, that uh, were made uh, by uh, the Royal Commission, uh, said that wages and workforce issues were a major component. And we know that uh, many people in aged care are currently earning about $22 an hour for doing what's physically demanding, emotionally distressing and a really tough job. Uh, during COVID, uh, we've had a, a lot of recognition of the role that particularly feminised industries do, childcare, aged care, our cleaners, in keeping the economy going, in keeping people safe. Uh, the idea that the federal government won't make a submission to the Fair Work Commission uh, supporting a wage rise is, I think, simply untenable. It's not up to us to determine what the wage rise is. It's up to the Fair Work Commission. Uh, but we would make a positive submission, and I've said that on a number of occasions. You said that you're up. We'll, we'll go. Everyone will get a go. Well, we'll wait and see. It did happen last time. You talked about it, but it did happen. There were about 500 witnesses to it. Um, and uh, we had uh, a big event uh, last time I was here. Uh, I'll continue to engage uh, with the Premier publicly and privately. Why is the Premier holding his own press conference on the other side of town at the same time? The Premier is doing his job as the Premier of Western Australia. Uh, we're meeting uh, today in the middle of the day, as, as we do regularly. Um, our, our diaries, I'm doing things all day. So at some stage, when the Premier does something, my next event is at 10 o'clock, my next event is at 12 o'clock, then I have an event in the afternoon. I've already done uh, two radio interviews, and uh, then we have an event tonight at, uh, I think it's at 5.30 or 6 o'clock. So I'm working right through. Uh, tomorrow I have five radio appearances, unless the Premier uh, went, uh, went missing and went on radio silence uh, for three days, then it's inevitable that we'll be doing some things at the same time. Um, petrol prices are verging on $2 a litre. Australians have been uh, paying record prices for the past year. What would an Albanese government do to, to help in the rising costs? Well, the first thing that we would have done is act on fuel security. We've been saying that for a long period of time. We said that at the last election. Uh, WA, of course, uh, had its, uh, its, its refinery uh, disappear. Uh, we've had, of the four refineries around Australia, two of them have shut on this government's watch. And when they spoke about fuel reserves, uh, which are nowhere near what the International Energy Agency says should occur, uh, they made an announcement, Angus Taylor, that we're having fuel reserves in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, how is that available uh, if uh, there's a shortage uh, here in Australia to be immediately, uh, immediately distributed? Uh, we need a, a government that takes uh, fuel security seriously, uh, this government has not taken fuel security seriously. It has come in belatedly and provided uh, support for the remaining uh, fuel, re fuel uh, refineries, but that is after, after half of them around the country have shut this term, during this term of government. On the floods, uh, did you consider delaying or shortening this trip? Is Perth the right place for you to be while Marrickville is sandbagging? Well, Marrickville, the area isn't in my electorate. Uh, it's at the bottom of my street. And uh, I was there with people uh, yesterday and uh, I committed to come to Perth. Uh, I was in my uh, 
my local area where I live there was a redistribution so I no longer live in in my electorate uh, so I am very confident uh, and in touch with uh, people there regularly I was in Brisbane uh, the uh, on yesterday morning and the day before and now I'm in Perth I want to represent the whole country I make no apologies for keeping my commitment uh, to the people of Western Australia uh, that I would visit and that I would, I would visit on day one, this has been planned uh, for some time and uh, as soon as the announcement was made and uh, I didn't want Lani to make all the travel over here by herself and find no one was here also. You've linked the floods to climate change and you said government's not doing enough to combat climate change belonging in the water. Does that include the McGowan government that is yet to legislate that zero by 2050? No, this is a national approach that is needed here. Uh, the, the McGowan government are, are doing their bit, uh, but it's a national approach that's required, a national leadership. Uh, the McGowan government isn't represented in Glasgow. I'll give you the big tip. Scott Morrison was, and he spoke to an empty room and gave an empty speech that had nothing in it uh, because there was no change to the 2030 target. Uh, what we're seeing is Australia, along with Saudi Arabia, Brazil, and just a few countries that weren't prepared to increase the target for 2030. That was the issue of Glasgow. That's what every country in the world knew was the issue with Glasgow. It's what Boris Johnson said was the issue with the Glasgow conference. He's, he's no member of the British Labor Party, Bar Boris Johnson, just like Margaret Thatcher, who led the world uh, when she was the British Prime Minister on climate change. This in most parts of the world, this is not the subject of ideological dispute. This is something that in most countries they understand not only that it's necessary to protect the environment but that good action on climate change is good for jobs and good for our national economy. Here we have a circumstance whereby Barnaby Joyce is in charge of Australia's climate policy. I'll uh, make this point as well. This is a failure of our parliament functioning properly because for more than a decade, in 2009, when the Labor government of Kevin Rudd tried to introduce uh, an emissions trading scheme that was endorsed by both John Howard and Kevin Rudd prior to the 2007 election, there was a clear majority in the House of Representatives for action on climate change. There has been a clear majority ever since. But because you have this rump as a handbrake on action, Australia isn't taking the action that is required, and that's meaning that we're missing out on jobs. There are enormous opportunities here. The last, uh, during the last visit uh, to Perth, uh, I was down with Madeleine King at the nickel refinery. We produce everything, particularly in Western Australia, lithium, nickel, uh, there's copper uh, in abundance in this country that goes into a battery. We could be making more things here. That's part of uh, what we see. An opportunity uh, is there for all to see. Last time I was here as well, uh, the work that's been done in the West on green hydrogen, enormous opportunity but only if we seize it and the, the slower we are to act the more other countries will get an advantage rather than Australia. Well they, they should talk to their industry because BHP support net zero by 2050, Woodside supports net zero by 2050, Rio Tinto supports net zero by 2050, FMG are doing a bit, you might have noticed Andrew Forrest talking about not just net zero by 2050 but far stronger action. Business knows that, that action on climate change is good for their business, that's why they're getting ahead. All of those businesses have targets that are stronger in 2030 than the federal government's target. They're falling behind. They know that secure employment, 
and the future of their businesses is tied to action in this area. And that's why they're taking action ahead of the government. What we have here is that the private sector are getting ahead of where the federal government is, uh, both in terms of its leaders, and I've met with all of uh, the above uh, on a regular basis. I've met uh, Andrew Forrest and the head of uh, Rio Tinto globally, uh, as well as uh, here in Australia, in the last week. And one of the things that they have spoken about um, is the, the need for uh, action and that they want to work and partner with government. That's the way you get successful industries. Businesses which are successful aren't ones that stand still. They're ones that get ahead of the curve. That's why they're successful compared with their competitors. That's the whole point here and we need to seize that opportunity and here in the West there's an extraordinary opportunity to benefit. Well, the only problem with that question is I then get another 20 questions about my entire cabinet. So Madeleine King will continue to play an important role. I think she's having, doing a great job. And it was a very conscious decision to appoint Madeleine and she will remain a very uh, key part of my team. What do you think the cost of a flood will be? How will you pay for the government? Do you think we need to consider another flood living? Well, look, the cost of the floods we don't know and it's not appropriate to speculate while the the rain is still falling. Uh, we don't know what the consequences are. I spoke to Andrew Johnson just this morning. Uh, there are warnings and evacuations taking place as, as we speak. But I'll tell you what the biggest cost is. The biggest cost has been a loss of life. The biggest cost when you have a flood or a major natural disaster uh, isn't economic, it's human. And we're seeing a devastating human cost and I want to express uh, my condolences to those people uh, who've lost loved ones during this crisis. Last one. Um, off the back of the emissions, WA is the only state not to incentivise uh, electric vehicles. What would you say on that and the McGowan government? Obviously, it's the way of the future and we've got the surplus and the McGowan government hasn't invested in that. Well, we'll be providing a national incentive by lowering taxes on electric vehicles. Uh, after we come here, uh, we will be uh, in, uh, in Hasluck with Tanya Lawrence looking at uh, community battery, which is another part of our component. Our component is major that we did in consultation uh, with uh, the business community. And I'll make this point. We announced our policy on December 3rd last year. Since then, we've had Parliament sit and not a single peep out of the government about our climate policy. Remember their scare campaigns? Uh, the federal government at the last election, not back in history, Scott Morrison said that electric vehicles would end the weekend. He said they couldn't tr tow your trailer, couldn't tow your boat. An absurd, uh, rather pathetic, uh, anti-science, anti-future, anti-jobs, anti-economy position that he held. Now we know, as we knew then, uh, that every auto manufacturer in the world, in Europe, in North America, in Asia, is all moving very fast to electric vehicles. Indeed, a number of auto manufacturers uh, simply won't be producing anything other than an, auto, uh, uh, an electric vehicle in the future. So this is something uh, that is happening. I attended as a transport minister a conference way back in 2006 in Tokyo, Japan, uh, whereby all of the world's auto manufacturers then had abandoned doing research into an internal combustion engine uh, focused vehicle and had already moved on. They've moved on to electric vehicles, hydrogen, uh, to clean energy. That has a number of advantages as well, even in terms of our air quality will benefit uh, from the shift uh, that will occur. What we've got is a policy of, of lowering taxes on them. But uh, we put forward that policy on December 3rd. It's a comprehensive plan powering Australia. It will lead to a 43% reduction in our emissions by 2030. 
uh, some 604,000 new jobs created, $52 billion of private sector investment. Of those jobs, five out of every six of them will be in regional communities, something that will make uh, an enormous difference uh, going forward. And it's been endorsed by the Business Council of Australia, the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, the Australian Industry Group, the National Farmers Federation, as well as the ACTU. We've got this policy right. It's fully costed. It's the most comprehensively costed plan of any policy by any opposition since Federation. It's an example of whereby Labor is all about the future. This government just want to be stuck in the past. They're scared of the present. They're terrified of the future. We need a government that's prepared to take up the opportunities that are there to seize the future. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.